breaking news tonight. A two year old shot in the head. Police are still trying to figure out how it happened. So here's what we know so far. San Antonio investigators are at a home near South Cross Boulevard and Pecan Valley Road on the southeast side of the city. The night team's Patty Santos is live at that scene. That's where the child was taken. So Patty, we got to start with this. How's that baby doing? Well, we are all holding our breath, just waiting to find out an update, a good update, because we know she was taken to University Hospital with a gunshot wound to the head. Take a look. This is the home where that happened just a couple of hours ago. We know that San Antonio police are still trying to figure out exactly how this happened. They tell us the mother was home along with a man who they believe is her boyfriend. Details on whether she was shot or whether she was uh, accidentally shot herself are still not clear. Police do say that the man that was here at the home took off before they arrived. At this point, they say they are looking for anyone who might have information on this shooting to give them a call. I can tell you, back live out here, the cries of that mother uh, as she was sitting behind that police car could be heard so loud out here in this community, uh, but she is cooperating with police and hoping Hopefully we will get uh, some kind of good update from the uh, police on how that child is doing as the night progresses. We'll send it back to you. Yeah, we can only hope that that two year old pulls it through. Thank you, Patty. Now, in the meantime, we do want to let you know local organizations do have a program to keep kids safe from firearms, and that program is called Gun Safety for Bear. It provides free gun locks for anybody. If you want, you can go and pick one up at a sheriff's substation, and we have a list of those locations for you on our website. KSAT.com. And of course, if we get an update on that two year old, we'll bring yes. it to you tonight. Firefighters staying busy this evening as well. Look at this. A grass fire spread near I-35 in West Ansley earlier tonight. This is on the city's southwest side. The flames glowing brightly in the area. While fire crews were there, firefighters seemed to be able to gain control over this fire. Those flames dying down about an hour before this newscast. High winds and a red flag warning yesterday should have been reasons enough not to start a fire. Apparently, someone ignored those warnings. They started a fire that grew to 15 acres yesterday on the south side of the county. Investigators say the case of arson burned down an RV and two mobile homes. There was also a down power line. Thankfully, firefighters were able to get the flames under control. But investigators now want to know who started that fire in the first place. And yesterday we had the red flag warnings, a combination of very low relative humidity and high winds spreading fires quickly. Today we didn't have those exact same conditions, but still it's very dry out there. We could use some rain. Luckily, we don't have the same winds out there today. And right now winds are actually calm, so temperatures are falling off quickly. It's still 53 Catula, 48 Carrizo Springs, even 48 in San Antonio. You get into the hill country, we have some 30s on the map. Kerrville right now at 39 degrees comfort, currently at 38. It's going to be a cool start to the day tomorrow. A chilly start right near freezing for most of us. But look at the trend for morning temperatures into early next week. We've got mornings in the 60s and wait to see what afternoons do then followed by another cold front. Get ready for a roller coaster. We'll talk about it in a bit. All right, Adam, thank you. Now tonight, four pets are dead and three homes are damaged after a fast moving fire forced neighbors to leave their west side homes. After those flames were out, one of the homeowners showed us what they believe started that fire. Well, my 63 didn't get touched, thank God. David Olivo is sorting through the damage after this morning's fire on Elvira Street. Flames tore through the walls of his home and into the kitchen. Pieces of debris even fell on the stove. But David said that's not where it started. He says that his son woke up to flames in the garage nearby. When I pulled back one of the panels, like the flames just came up. He was trying to get inside that garage because he knew the family pets were there. Olivo says they were trying to keep several dogs and puppies warm with a space heater. This, this is one of the space heaters. This thing right here. That's what caused the fire. Olivo thinks the heater may have tipped onto some clothes. Four dogs made it out, but four puppies got trapped. Sad. I mean, uh, these puppies, I love them with all my heart. Olivo says they were trying to get hoses when they noticed flames were traveling towards a grill with a propane tank. Winds also spread flames to two other neighboring homes. The Red Cross is helping those families tonight, and Olivo's wife is trying to remain hopeful. We just have to start all over. I won't give up. 
Yeah, you have to feel for them. I mean, that's horrible. All of those working with his insurance to see what repairs can be made. In the meantime, Animal Care Services is housing those four dogs that we told you about a moment ago for the next five days. And the family is hoping to get the debris cleared out and a fence in place to bring their pets back home. Have to feel for that family at night. All right, we're getting more information on that human smuggling case we've been following since yesterday. Court documents show a group of 40 undocumented migrants were picked up in Laredo, put into a tractor trailer. The driver said he was going to be paid a little more than $72,000, had a passenger who told investigators he worked with that driver in similar operations before. Well, according to documents, a gray Dodge Durango escorted them to a location off Briggs Road. That's where a witness told investigators people were getting out of that 18 wheeler and into other separate cars. Investigators say those different vehicles were driven by three undocumented people and one U.S. citizen. Some of those drivers were also expecting to be paid, according to documents. Investigators detained people at three different scenes along with the suspects. Cash also seized in this case. Now, new on the night beach shopping center businesses have had enough of vandals and thieves. Two centers in particular on the west side have experienced there. They've been targeted over the past few weeks. And as police investigate, tenants are telling the night team's John Paul Barajas that they also want their councilwoman to help stop those thieves. Just stop. It's killing my business. So I've had graffiti. I've had vandalism on my vans. I've had vagrants that decided to want to urinate at my front door. These two men say a series of small crimes are costing them thousands of dollars. They work at separate West Side shopping centers, but face similar issues. The most recent break in happening Monday at the shopping center off General McMullen in Calabria. The owner there asked to remain anonymous. There's supposed to be an AC unit in there. Yes, sir. <laughs> there is. It's all gone. The, the guy cannibalized it, and I'm sure he, he walks, so he just takes what he can. He'll take the aluminum, take the copper. According to the owner, it's been happening for about a year. He says one man continues to pop up on their cameras, but you can't see his face. Adding the man smashed the front door of this restaurant and has forced his way into pretty much all of their storage units. There's lots of remnants of locks that we replaced over the months. There's one right there. There's another remnant there. There's another another piece here. Top part right there. So he just goes to town. There's another lock there. He actually, I don't know, he got a crowbar so and broke all that off, so. There's not much of value in the units, the owner explained. But replacing the locks does add up. Five, six thousand dollars, I'm sure. The, the front door was three hundred fifty dollars. And just two miles away, a shopping center off South Sarzamora and West Commerce had forty dollars worth of copper stripped from electrical lines, in turn killing power to the entire strip. Someone cut through a chain link fence to do it, according to Cano Health Regional Director Rafael Pena. So forty costed me thousands. <laughs> Figure the math on that. Now, on top of all that, that man who wished to remain anonymous said he owns property at a third shopping center in that area, and they, too, are having similar issues. Now, both men we spoke with said they have reached out to SAPD about added patrols, as well as reached out to District 5 Councilwoman to see if she can help out with all the issues they've had with crime. They have yet to hear back. We've reached out to the District 5 Councilwoman as well, but us, too, have not heard back at this time. In front of City Hall, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Let's go to a coach now with a lot of questions. Dozens of parents voicing their concerns tonight about this man. Lee Crisp is Medina Valley's athletic director and head football coach. The defenders confirmed he failed a drug screening before he was promoted to those positions. Coach Crisp admitted to taking medication without a prescription in his application for those positions way back in 2019. It's concerning because those same records show he had a commercial driver's license with the school bus endorsement. Sources say Crisp no longer drives athletes to and from events. Sources also tell our defenders Crisp was placed on leave after community members came forward, but he actually returned to work earlier this week. Parents want to know what the district found in their investigation of this coach. They're still using that good old boy system that they've been using for years, and I think they're just a lot of them very close minded. 
The district apparently giving very little information to us or those parents. They voiced other complaints against the coach, like refusing to allow a football player to ride home with the team following a game in Lockhart in October, and that he made fun of other play, uh, another player's lisp at back-to-back -back practices last fall. A district spokeswoman had previously referred to the complaints against that coach as rumors or unsubstantiated allegations. The first week of early voting is over. We still have another week to go before the March primary. And among a long list of races that voters will see, the race for Bear County judge. Former County Commissioner Trisha Berry is running as a Republican, and she says that she's prioritizing jail overtime and the use of officer body cameras. Now, earlier this evening, she told KSAT that she wants to reduce the poverty rate in our community. And I think people want that kind of leadership. They want folks to stand up represent, make sure we're not wasting money, but also at the same time, moving this community forward. We've been speaking with several of the candidates running for Bear County Judge, and you can find all of those interviews on KSAT.com. Up next on the supply chain shortage, paint. I'll tell you why, up next. Plus our rodeo coverage is coming up and our Greg Simmons has the wild ride in the ring tonight. And the U.S. says a Russian attack on Ukraine is imminent, but that could do more than just affect our allies overseas. What officials are watching for right here at home. Next on the Night Beat. The tension between Ukraine and Russia continuing. The U.S. confident Russia will attack, but it's unclear exactly when. President Joe Biden speaking with several NATO heads of state today. He warned in a news conference as well that Russia will pay a steep price if they invade. Here at home, the Department of Homeland Security telling private officials and governors to be on guard against potential Russian cyber attacks. Police hoping to find a missing San Antonio woman tonight. Valerie Ingorvaya has been cele celebrated Thanksgiving with family in Fort Worth, was on her way back to San Antonio when she disappeared two years ago. Investigators last pinged her phone along Highway 173 between Hondo and Castroville. She would have turned 41 on Monday. San Antonio police say Fort Worth police have taken over that investigation, but family also hired a private investigator in hopes of finding some answers soon. The avocado ban didn't last long. Mexico now allowed to export the popular produce back into the U.S. once again. That ban came on the eve of the Super Bowl after someone threatened an American food inspector in Michoacan. Well, the Associated Press noted it's that same area where cartels try and extort avocado farmers. The USDA DA is working with Mexican authorities to enhance safety measures for inspectors in the fields there. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. And now we're going to check in on the local COVID-19 numbers. Metro Health reporting 280 new cases and 11 more deaths. The seven day average now 572 hospitalizations. We're also noticing are going down as well. 532 COVID patients are in the hospital. 137 are in the intensive care unit and 77 are on ventilators. You know, throughout these last few years, we have been seeing the ripple effects of this pandemic. I mean, think about all the shortages that we've yeah. seen, that we've gone through, and now you can add one more to the list. Paint, as in the paint that you actually use for your home. Yeah, there's no way to gloss this one over. There is a shortage of it, and yes, the pandemic is partly why. The Night Team's Patty Santos reports last year's freeze, also a culprit. <laughs> A mixture of troubles has led to increasing paint prices up to 30% higher. Entry level paint, which is uh, called in the, the contractor line, that's probably $32 uh, right around there, uh, where it used to be about 24, 22. Danny Garcia, co-owner of Pintura Paint, says it started with a COVID-19 labor shortage paired with an increase of demand from those stuck in home doing renovation projects. <laughs> Then there was an aluminum shortage, often used to create paint cans, followed by the 2021 Texas weather disaster that impacted warehouses and plants. When the freeze happened, the raw materials, were, they were stored outside, so that made it really, really hard because it was literally wiped out with the freeze. Garcia, who also owns a contracting company, says the paint problems are chipping away at earnings from construction projects. 
painters aren't finishing their jobs because the builders won't pay them until they're finished. And so it just, you know, homes are taking longer to finish and it just makes things a little bit more difficult. Even paint for roads, traffic and sports fields are hard to find. Garcia says spring is a prime painting season. Anyone with upcoming projects needs to order ahead and expect to pay more. If you use a good uh, paint with a primer inside of it, it's going to save you time and money. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Well, this is good to know. Okay, we're going to take a live look outside right now. 48 degrees and uh, yeah, we're going to be seeing a lot of shifts in weather over the next few days. Yeah, another night where it just cooled off rapidly. Yeah, uh, yeah temperatures fall out in uh, these conditions. We have a fairly clear sky, calm wind and dry air and actually a beautiful sunset. I want to start with that before we get into what's going to happen over the weekend and even into next week because get ready for uh, Another roller coaster ride of temperatures. Beautiful sunset this evening. This is from one of our KSAT 12 viewers. I love the caption here. My four, four year old asked if there was lava in the sky this evening. <laughs> I understand. I could see why they would ask that, but beautiful sunset. And I captured it here from our city cam. Today, 34 earlier this morning, well below the average of 46. Then this afternoon, we topped out at 63 degrees. So another below average day. And so far this month, of February, we're running more than five degrees below average. Temperatures for the most part, 40s across the state, still some 50s south of San Antonio, 30s as well in the Hill Country. Junction 38, get to Austin 37, Kerrville 35. Meanwhile, still 52 in Del Rio. This is what we're expecting on the map tomorrow morning, right near freezing again, kind of like earlier today. Obviously, some areas, especially outlying areas and locations north of San Antonio, probably about a degree or so below freezing. And then we get into tomorrow afternoon and we're well into the 60s. I mean, we're talking mid to even upper 60s for high temperatures. And then Sunday afternoon is going to be similar. So no big changes Sunday afternoon, still well into the 60s. Monday and Tuesday, we're talking low to mid 80s. So a big warm up there. But then our next cold front pays us a visit and the bottom falls out. We'll drop a good 40 degrees between Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday afternoon. We'll be down in the 40s most of the day on Wednesday, and I think by the afternoon, which is typically the warmest time of day, we'll only be near 40 degrees. So temperatures falling throughout the day next Wednesday. Nothing to worry about this weekend. Warm to start the work week, and then temperatures fall off. Luckily, with that cold front, we're not talking about any drastic cold nights or mornings. Just a brief light freeze with it. That's it. Quiet weather pattern right now. One little swirl west of San Francisco. That's going to drop southward. Really just helps sling some Pacific moisture our way on Sunday. So increasing cloud cover and more gray in the sky on Sunday. Also we'll have some increasing humidity. There is a favorable pattern for precipitation, just not here in our part of Texas as we get into next week. We just have slight, slight chances. We're talking 20 to 30 percent Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Tomorrow, nothing but sunshine. That cool start will lead to 65 in the afternoon and even a few degrees warmer as we get into Sunday. We talked about that temperature drop. Luckily, it just comes with a brief light freeze by next Thursday with those slight rain chances. Adam, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, he is my favorite spur. Well, I have a lot of favorite spurs, but he's, <laughs> he's I have a Manu Ginobili jersey. You could argue he's the most popular spur ever with yeah. San Antonio fans because he played with such passion. Manu Ginobili one step closer to the Hall of Fame, but so is another former Spurs player. Who might that be? We'll let you know. And we're in Buda for the girls' high school basketball playoffs coming up. He's a very special human being and a very unique player who was uh, instrumental in us having success. Former Spurs star Manu Ginobili has just one more hurdle to clear to get his call to the hall in big board sports. Congratulations, four-time NBA champion, Olympic gold medalist Manu Ginobili, who has become a finalist for the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2022. That announcement made today during All-Star Weekend in Cleveland with the Honors Committee having the final say during the Final Four in April. Ginobili is a no-brainer as far as Spurs and international basketball fans are concerned. He helped the Spurs win four NBA titles in 2003, 05, 07, and 2014. After the Spurs made him a second-round draft pick in 1999, he brought his Euro step to the NBA after winning a Euro League championship and later leading his Australian, I uh, should say, <laughs> his Argentina national team to a gold medal in the tw 2004 Olympics for 
his contributions to silver and black. His number 20 jersey is already hanging in the rafters of the AT&T Center. And now his first year of eligibility has just one more step to take before he gets his call to the hole. Motto, uh, you know, obviously an iconic uh, game changer, so to speak. You know, the Euro step, you know, he brought it over here and uh, his competitiveness, his winning ways uh, have been heralded for a long time. And uh, it's, it's thrilling to see him be rewarded. Former Spur George Carl is also a finalist for the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. You may remember Carl suited up for the Silver and Black starting in 1973 when they were in the ABA. Played until his retirement in 1978. He then became an assistant coach for the Spurs before becoming a head coach in the NBA for the Cleveland Cavaliers in 1984. He'd also have head coaching stints with the Golden State Warriors, the Seattle Supersonics back then, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Denver Nuggets, Sacramento Kings. We mastered a total of 1,175 victories, which is six on the all-time NBA regular season coaching victories lives. Unfortunately, Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond was not voted in as a finalist of the Hall of Fame with Manu, despite the fact Hammond is a six-time WNBA All-Star in a 16-year WNBA career that included eight seasons with the San Antonio Stars. And for her retirement in 2014, she was voted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame just a few days ago. Before that, was named one of the WNBA's 25 greatest and most influential players last year, finishing her career with more than 3,000 points, 800 assists, but no call to the Hall again today. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL has informed the House Oversight Committee and reform that Mary Jo White will lead the investigation into new allegations surrounding the Washington Commander's owner, Dan Snyder. White is a former chair of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, which also led the 2018 investigation into Carolina Panthers owner Jerry Richardson, who had been accused of workplace misconduct, including sexual harassment. Former Washington employee, Tiffany Johnston has accused Snyder of placing his hand on her thigh under a table at a work dinner and later tried to force her into his limousine. The NFL says a written report will be released to the public. The college football playoff will remain at four teams right now through the remaining four years of his contract that ends in 2025. That's after 10 FBS commissioners and Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick determined that they could not come to unanimous agreement about a 12-team format, according to ESPN. The CFB's board of managers then approved that recommendation. And the Circuit of the Americas course in Austin announced today they have reached a five-year extension on their agreement with F1. Popularity of that sport is growing in the United States is evident. 100,000 attending in their first year in Texas, up to 400,000 this year, following one year off due to COVID. There had been concerns since Miami was going to host F1 starting this May. High school basketball playoffs and bull riding. Next. Double header tonight. Second round of girls high school basketball playoffs in Buda with the Steel nice leading things off against Cedar Ridge. Steel led by 11 at halftime. It was only a three point game when they pick up the action here with four and a half to play. The Lady Raiders to Kyria Hamilton driving the lane for the layup to cut the lead down to one. Steel Sydney Love attacking the paint. Spins and knocks down the jumper. Make it 40 37 Steel under a minute to go now. Love with a great dish to Addison James under the basket for the bucket and Steel advances 49 43. Second game of the playoff double header tonight featured the Clark Cougars against Vista Ridge, Haley Adams pulls up for the long jumper. It's off the mark, but Ariana Roberson grabs a rebound, puts it back up and in. Eight-point lead right there. Roberson in the lane. Stops, spins, and knocks down the jumper. The lead grows to 10. Just before the half, Ramsey Robledo nails a corner three. Clark goes into halftime about 29-13. The final from Buda, 70-38 Clark. Bull fighters Cody Webster, Chuck Swisher, ready for some bull riding tonight in San Antonio Rodeo. This is Bubba Gregg on board Sun Devil, and he is a devil. He not only throws him, but makes Bubba face plant in the process. Ouch. Whoa. How about Gavin Michael trying to tame train station? Whoa. Look at the size of this bull. Look at how he's leaving the ground. That's tough to stay on. In fact, the judges know that because they give him an 86 and a half. But Garrett Wicked on board Big R as a rider the night. He gets an 87 and a half. And then Big R, after he throws his rider, the cowboy, goes after Big Mitchell, the dummy, popped up, propped up in the middle of the AT&C Center and he ran over him. But lucky that's not cool. Not a cowboy. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. He was looking for somebody else to run over after he ran over that <laughs> exactly. Dummy. <laughs> it was a dummy. It was. Yeah. We'll be right back.